Next, I want to introduce Haley Matson Mathis. Haley is. <laughs> Haley is the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization that supports culinary education at the high school level. How many high schools do you have now? 34. 34? <laughs> On all the islands. All the High school, post-secondary like this, as well as professional cooks and chefs. They have programs for all those levels of, of cooking. And they sponsor this assembly every single semester since I can remember, since 2008 maybe or something like that. And uh, you're in for a treat. We have a very special guest tonight, today. One of my favorite chefs. And what I appreciate about chef is He's dedicated to education, which is awesome, because I'm a teacher. <laughs> Haley? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always my favorite thing to come to your campus, because I think you have a great team of instructors, and you have a lot of fun doing it, as well as really executing and delivering some of the best graduates that are out there working in the industry. So you have a great legacy to live up to here. The White Culinary Education Foundation is, as Don said, a nonprofit, and we're dedicated to all of you. And that's why when I come here every semester, our whole reason for existing and for being is to champion the next generation that's coming up in the culinary profession, whether it's at the high school level or at the community college level or those who are starting out working in the industry. Chef Don serves on our advisory board, and our guest chef today, Chef Vikram Garge, is a critical member of our advisory board because he helps us with our critical fundraiser that we do every year the an Indian dinner at his restaurant this year uh, which took place in August Umi uh, is located uh, he is the chef owner of Umi it's located in Waikiki uh, directly across from the Holly Kalani Hotel property if you know where that is in the Holly Puna Hotel it's uh, dedicated to the bounty of the sea so, but today we're going to be talking about Indian cuisine because Chef Vikram trained um, in India and has worked at Five Diamond Properties, hotel properties around the world. And as well as he had a restaurant in uh, Washington, D.C., in the blue. But he's really a chef that's about much more than Indian cuisine. He's very much focused on global flavors and has worked with some of the highest level clientele delivering the most exquisite food imaginable. So you're in for a treat today. As Chef Don mentioned, Chef Vikram is very focused on mentoring. And we were talking before the class started about how many chefs that are out working in the industry that have come up through his uh, ranks um, when he was at the Holly Kalani Hotel at one time as a chef um, and at other properties and who are now working at their own establishments. So he's very good about mentoring and I've had some of those chefs teach for us recently and they've, they've talked about how he really transformed their career by teaching them about um, some of the finer things in cuisine and dedication to quality and mastery of technique. And he is definitely that a master. So you're in for a treat, Chef Vikram. Thank you for Thank making you. time for being with us. Thank you. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Great. Good. Well, what do you want to What do you want to uh, learn today? I've got something to demo. What do you want to learn? What do you What do you all want to cook? You want to open a place. What do you want to cook? I mean, you're cooking, right? You want to be cooks. You want to be chefs. Why? Do you know why you want to be a chef? The action. Like the action? What do you like about it? It's the most boring job in the world. <laughs> you work when everybody's sleeping, you, holidays you work, Sundays you work, and you know, there's, you burn yourself in the heat, you sweat. It's nasty out there, right? It is. It is, right? Well, what do you want to do it? You want to sit in the AC room, have a nice air condition, Right with the pen, go home at five o'clock, have a beer, spend time with the family, right? It's about passion, right? If you wanna be a chef, 
it's not about cooking only. Cooking is a part of it, it's all about passion. You're doing, it's an art, it's a skill, it's an artist. It's the guys who play music, you know, they play jazz in the middle of the night in clubs under, underground, you know, their life is all about music. So chef, being a chef is all about passion. Um, there's a proverb, uh, Chinese proverb, which, which if you've heard about it, if not, it said, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Right? Listen to it carefully. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Have you heard that? So, give a cook a recipe, you make him a cook for the rest of the life. You teach them the fundamentals and the science of food and cooking, you make them a chef. If you translate that, think it from that perspective. So, my philosophy in food, in, in training, in mentoring, and with my team is, I can easily give you a recipe, here's the recipe, make the dish. But cooking is, in my opinion, is 90% science, right? What, what is there in cooking? What, what are we looking at, right? There are five T's in cooking in my, in my world. What are the five T's? Time, time modifying, pace, You do it every day. Think logically, you're doing it right now. It's just how you, how you process it, right? What are the five T's? Think about it. Time, you said time. Temperature. Technique. Technique. Someone said something? Taste. Taste. What's the last T? Talent. Right? If you lack the talent, Right? It's a talent. How do you make the talent? It's time, temperature, technique, taste, and talent. Right? There's nothing you can cook without temperature, time, whether it's hot, cold. If you really put your logic, your thinking into any dish, all of these will come in place some, in some part of the other. So what does it make? Science. Time is science. Water boils at 100 degrees centigrade or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a science. Right? That doesn't change, doesn't matter which part of the world, what cuisine you cook, where you go in the world, it's the same. Time doesn't change. It takes 40 minutes to bake a cake. That 40 minutes doesn't, it changes with the altitude and all of that, but it's a science, right? So what you really learn in a cooking is, what is the thought behind that dish, what you're making, or the cuisine, or the food you're cooking, in the fundamental. If you do fundamental class with the chefs, what is in that fundamental? You're understanding the science of it. Someone asked me two days ago, what's your favorite cookbook? I said, my favorite cookbook is On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee, right? Have you heard of that? It's not a cookbook, it's a science, right? It tells you if you're making an egg, at what temperature the egg white coagulates, at what temperature the yolk coagulates. Once you understand that, all that hollandaise sauce, bearnaise sauce, poaching of egg, cuddling of egg, you can fix it. It's no rocket science, it's in the back of your head. You know, you'll be smiling when something goes wrong because you know the science. Remember that, right? That's my favorite cookbook. All of the cookbook is a nice coffee table book. I like to look at pictures, you know, right? Recipes are ratios, always remember that, right? Have you all done your fundamentals? You're in it? Yes. I mean, this might be, I don't want to overwhelm you with this. Do you all know how to make bechamel? Have you know, heard the word bechamel? What is the recipe for bechamel? I don't know, I, I, I've never made bechamel. <laughs> I want to make bechamel, tell me how I make it. Give me a recipe. I got it, but how much onion, how much roux, what is it? You can really how much trial and error, error but it's like, like, make. On the roux, like a gallon of milk. How much I want to make, right? Yeah. Doesn't matter, I want to make 
one pound, I might want to make thousand pounds, it doesn't matter how much I want to make, right? So that's the recipe. Okay, let me, let me make you think differently. If I tell you one, one, ten, what does it make? What do you think about it? One, one, ten. That's going to be plus two sugars. Exactly. You got the recipe now? One part of butter, one part of flour, ten parts of milk. Right? That's your basic, bechamel. Doesn't matter you want to make one ounce, you want to make hundred ounce. That's your recipe. Someone wakes you in the middle of the night, how do I make bechamel? One, one, ten. Take one part of butter, one part of flour, ten parts of milk, make a roux, add the milk, put a clue, the onion, the clove, one onion. Even if you go with half to one onion, it will not make much of a difference. What will make a difference is one, one, ten. Make sense? So always learn the ratios, always learn that. So recipes are great guidelines for you to get into the, to understand it, but really cooking is all about understanding it to a point, what happens to a, what, what is the science behind it? What, how much roux can the, the flat, the milk take or the water take? Same thing with velouté. Then how you thin it down? Same thing with hollandaise when you make it, right? So those are the things which I'm, the reason why I'm saying that is because we all go off to cookbooks. Oh, I want to buy this cookbook, I want to buy that cookbook. That is the philosophy of the chef or the guy who wrote the cookbook. The fundamentals don't change. So whoever wrote the fundamentals are what we have to understand for us to become where we are. And any cuisine you go, it does not matter you're cooking French, Chinese, Indian, any cuisine you cook, there's a ratio. Bakery, there's a ratio. What is a good sodium in a dish? We say salt to taste. I disagree with that. To taste is after you put the basic fundamental level in there. What is the sodium level any dish should have? Minimum. Like for, for, for a normal palate. Minimum 1%, I'd say. And I guess I know it's a little bit too much, but I'm just giving you a thought for food. A food for thought. Two percent, right? When you, once you go in advance into cooking and all, you'll understand two percent, right? You need two percent salt to have this, for a person who's very sensitive to salt to taste the salt well. And after that, it can be adjusted two and a half, three percent. And then you add the sugar, it, you balance it off. So there's a whole different science, right? If someone will say, I'm making 100 pounds of beef, how much salt do I need for that? When I calculate a recipe, I don't go to a supermarket and buy 10 pounds of salt because I'm cooking 200 pounds of beef. There has to be some ratio in my mind to buy. That comes your buying thing, you know, how much you're buying, how much you're keeping it, right? So these are the things which I'm talking about. So we'll get into food. What today, what we're going to do is, I don't want you to look at the recipe and understand it, understand the philosophy of the dish, where it comes from. And, and you know what, for all of us, it depends where we come from. We can be coming from any part of the world, any part of the, growing up and eating any kind of a cuisine, right? We all have memories in our head, right? We all remember, we all connect with something, right? And when you connect with something, when you eat it, subconsciously your brain tells you, ah, that reminds me of my childhood, right? It makes you happy. So food is about happiness, you know, exploring it, trying different things is, is how you want to connect it. So how is the dish which we are making today connect, connect the world is what are, we're going to talk about. More, you're going to taste it, we're going to make it. This is the easy part. This is the easiest part of culinary. Trust me, right? The most difficult part is understanding it. So we are, what we are doing today is when I, when Haley called me, said, you want to do a class on Indian food? I said, Indian food, if you can learn in one class, you know, I would be, we would have millions of chefs running around, right? But I want you to understand the fundamental of it. I want you to understand the philosophy behind it. I want to understand the history behind it, right? And how to use it. So I chose a dish, which is smoked vindaloo. And I promise you, half of you in the room know about it, eaten it in some form or the other, but how it's transformed over thousands of years, right? So, you know the Silk Road, you know who, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Marco Polo, what did he do? From Portugal. He traveled from Portugal, went all over the world, right? And when they were traveling in those days, in 1400s, they, they went by their boats, sailboats, right? 
none of them died and the, they want to eat. And one, one of the staples in Portugal is the pork, right? So what he did was he took pork, put wine in it, <coughs> and garlic. <coughs> Why wine and garlic, excuse me? Because garlic helps in killing the bacteria, wine turns into vinegar. So they had these big barrels of pork filled with wine and vinegar. Port Portugal is known for the wine, cheap wine, huh? not the good ones. <laughs> and um, so they traveled with that, right? And as they went everywhere, they ate that and shared with people. When they came to Hawaii, there's a Hawaii version of that. They went to Philippines, it was called mandalos, right? It's basically pork, garlic, and wine. And then they ended up in, in, in Goa in India in 1400, I think the year is put on there, 1498. And the Indians said, wait a minute, I'm not gonna eat pork with vinegar and garlic, I want chilies, I want spices. So the Indian, they added spice to it, instead of calling it vandalos because it was not easily pronounced, they started calling it vindaloo. So came the pork vindaloo. So if you really look at the origin of the dish, it's, it's from Portuguese. Because they added spices and made it their own, it became a very, very uh, interesting dish out of India, right? So if you really look at the dish, there are major ingredients are what? Garlic, pork, and vinegar white wine vinegar, right? I mean, of course, recipes just evolve with people. It changes over time. People add their own little spin to it, right? If you go, hey, how do you make your lao lao? I make it this way. How do you make your, I make it this way. So everybody's got their own touch to it. There's nothing wrong with it, but the fundamentals don't change. And then they, in India, we started adding spices to it, right? And, in, in, and then it became a very popular dish in Goa because it's a Portuguese colony and people started eating with rice, with little bread and all of that. And so the evolution of Vindaloo, and no one thinks it, connects it back to Portuguese. That is actually Portuguese dish transformed into an Indian dish, right? It's just the pronunciation, you know. They could not pronounce Vandalos, so they called Vindaloo. So it was written and then the spelling changed over a period of time, everything changed. Like, like us, like from monkeys we became today like this, so we also changed, right? Evolution of, of human, right? That's, that's, that's basically the food it is. So this is all because for you to understand and it's easy for cooking now. Let's look at the, the part of the recipe, what do we have? And if you break down that recipe, it all goes down to ratios, right? There's 15% of onion to, to, the, to the pork and there is 20% of vinegar, and there is 10% of garlic to the weight of the meat, right? If you look at the recipe. So normally when I real, uh, memorize the recipe, when I want to do it, people say, how do you remember it? That's how I remember it. What's the ratios? There's certain fundamental ratios which you need to keep. So I always break it down to ratio on this piece of paper, right? And memorize it to do it. And those ratios are pretty much same with a lot of the different dishes. In Indian cooking, when we go in Indian cooking, how do you make curry? The base, the, the restaurants, okay, there's a base curry. What is a base curry? One part of onion, two parts of tomatoes. So 100%, 200%, 30%, 20%. how we, we, we memorize it back home, how much spice goes into each dish. Right? And then it changes, the quality of the spice is not good, you add more or you reduce it, you know, depends on where you buy or what you buy. So, so that's, that's very important for you to understand as future chefs, right? And what's the difference, as I start to cook, what's the difference between a chef and a, and a, and a cook? A cook cooks, but a chef knows why. Any other answer? Have you heard uh, all cognacs are brandy, but all brandies are not cognacs? Okay. There's a saying that when you go into the, in the liquor, when you do classes on that, cognac is a kind of brandy, right? All cognacs are brandy, but all brandies are not cognacs, right? It's made in a certain way, it reached a certain level or from a certain area, how it's has done it, how it's, it's everything. So all, all chefs are cooks. 
No one comes to my restaurant because I'm a chef, because I'm a cook. They want to eat my food. When I cook a food, I'm a cook. Make sense? So that, that fundamental never changes in life. Let me put it this way. People think that I've become a chef. I don't want to cook. I don't want to do anything. I can sit in the office and do my work. That does not change. So you always remain a cook. A chef is, in addition to that, that you can write a recipe, you can start thinking differently, you can compose a menu, you can run an organization. So it comes with a lot of many different hats, like you have the, the full entourage out there. They have done all of that to reach there. So it takes time to be a chef. It doesn't become overnight. There's a lot of different hats you start to wear when you want to be a chef, right? Okay, a lot of talking. We'll start cooking now, because I'm sure you want to eat. Um, so look at the recipe of spices. In India, when we blend spices, every recipe, the spices change. The ratios change. The, the, have, has anybody seen the movie 100 Foot Journey? What do you think of that movie? It's a good movie? I know it's a good movie. What's your opinion about it? Inspiring. It's inspiring. What's the inspiring about it? What, 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 what was the change which happened in that movie if you look at it? If you see in that movie, if we've not seen it, I mean, of course, you can always um, see it. He carries a spice box with him. Don't remember that? There was a little box with the spices and everything else when the, when the Michelin star chef, um, remember that? So basically, it's about the flavor. What he did in that, it's a very good movie to watch because one of the, one of the main person behind that movie who was involved is a good friend of mine. He unfortunately passed away during COVID. He was one of the first person to go for COVID. Um, he, was, he, he directed the whole concept of food in there. So in that movie, if you really see that, the, 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 the French restaurant, or the Michelin restaurant was doing very well, but they were not in that level. And they, this guy opened an res Indian restaurant across the street. They used to enjoy the aroma of it. They hired the chef who was very passionate, who was the chef of the Indian restaurant to come and work at the Michelin restaurant because he wanted to cook French food. And he introduced the flavors of different spices into that food, right? <clears throat> and why he could do that was because he knew the fundamentals. He knew what French cuisine was about and what Indian cuisine is about and how he could infuse them, okay? Fusion is confusion. Someone says, do you cook fusion food? I say it's confusion. It's infusion. How he could infuse that? The DNA should not change. The DNA was there, right? The DNA of French food was there, but it was enhanced with little spices which the French were not used to. Or the Indian food was enhanced by techniques of cooking or presentation of the French cuisine, which, which takes it up. So, these are, the reason I'm telling you, these are the real life stories, if you see it. We watch movies, and nowadays, you know, technology is in, in, your, in your hand. You can just go, hey, I want to watch a movie on your phone. In our days, we used to go to a movie hall or a theater somewhere to watch a movie. Okay, so what I've done is I've taken all the ingredients out here, which says spice paste. So garlic, um, other than sugar, I've taken everything else, put it in this, and I'm going to make a paste. We're going to marinate the pork in the paste and cook it with the onions, and the dish is finished. That's it. The, the key in this dish, what is, the, what is the key thing in this dish is this, the paste, right? So it's not the pork, it's the paste. If your paste is off, off flavor or it's, the ratios are off, your dish is gone, right? It's very simple. That's why not too much sauteing and not too much cooking on there.
See? So what I'm trying to show you here is, we, we've been talking and, and I'm gonna make the dish now. How quick and how, by the way, in my restaurant we don't, we have zero waste, we don't throw this. You know what we do with this? Stocks, of course, you can use stock. I dehydrate this, or freeze dry this and make powder, and make onion powder, and use it in cooking, right? So we are a zero waste kitchen um, at Umi, and um, even with the beef, when, the, when we get ribeye, everything is, we do eel test, what we call it. What is eel test? Eel test is basically, if, if 100 pounds of beef came into the kitchen, how many steaks we cut, how many pounds of steak was cut, right? How much of uh, trim we got, for me, and how much of fat we got, and when we get the fat, we make tallow out of it. Tallow is the render the fat, and then we cook with tallow. We cook potatoes with tallow. Tallow is one of the ingredients in all the cosmetics. All the cream and lotions we use, 80% of them have tallow, right? Tallow is very, very, in the olden days, people used to rub tallow on their skin to, to look pretty, you know? So, instead of going to, next time when you see a beef, you just. <laughs> so, yeah, so and then, what means, so our wastage on, on, on a ribeye is 3%. Not the bone in, regular, 3%. The rest, everything gets consumed in some shape or the other, some form or the other, right? So that's also very important, how, how you use it. So in this part, what I've got here is oil, which already pre put in there, right? There's oil in there, very little oil, because pork has got enough, enough um, uh, fat in it, it'll render its own fat. And this is a recipe where you don't do too much of sauteing and cooking. So normally, you would do your, you know, marination. What is marination? Why do we marinate? Yeah, we marinate because it absorbs the flavor. You do, um, you know, you, you brine, you marinate to enhance the flavor so that the meat or the protein soaks in the flavor, whatever it's there. Same thing with this. And remember, this pork was traveling in the, in the boats for hundreds of thousands of days. In, in vinegar and garlic, so it was it was already cooked in that, right? When it traveled. So, but we are doing a quick one because we're in a demo here. Normally, what we do is we make we take this pork, we make a paste like this, right? And then we let's see. We marinate it. See the color. I did nothing, huh? I just pressed the switch. Now, so you can make this thing like this and keep it for months. When we make it, we make it for six months. You know why? Nothing will happen to it. There's so much of garlic and vinegar in it. The one in the cup, that's not wine, by the way, that's vinegar, right? The vinegar in it, that nothing is going to happen to it, right? And Gently massage it. Good for the barbecue, huh? You can use this, uh, you can use this um, uh, marination for a lot of other stuff too. It's, you don't have to use it just for, just for the pork. If you want to marinate fish, it's pretty strong. If you marinate fish, you can do that. In Indian cooking, one thing is very important is at what stage you add what, right? When we do the Indian dinner at the restaurant, I mean, I only do it once a year for the Culinary Education Foundation. And, and people ask me that, why don't I open an Indian restaurant? I said, I, my, my answer to them is, I would love to but it's a lot of technique and a lot of, you need to have that, that, that feeling for the food, you know? It's like how your mom cooks, she, she has no weighing scale at home. She just puts it with the hand and, and feels it, right? It's cooking by the feeling. 
That's why when I said cooking is all about passion, it's about, about what, what do you want? You have to cook. I mean, I know the day I'm not feeling well, my food is not good. I leave the kitchen, I don't cook that day. I tell my chefs, I'm not gonna be in the kitchen. They're like, why? I said, I know that I cannot give my best, right? So it's a, it, it, it's not a factory where, yes, you can create recipes where it's a, it can be in a factory and it can go ahead, but really when you want to have an experience, yeah, a lot of the places, that there, that's why there's so many different kind of restaurant. You can go to, uh, to one of the fast foods, you know, it's the food is made, someone in the factory come in, someone is heating it and giving it to you. And you go to a fine dining restaurant or a, a chef-driven restaurant, you can see the passion of the chef was given out there, right? So if you can see on your television out there, you see that onions, and I'm using red onions specifically. There's a difference between all different onions we have. This has got a little bit more sweeter. It's got a little bit more sweetness, it caramelizes. You know, that's a science. And then to what, temper to what degree you take it, the caramelization changes. It'll start to become bitter after some time. So right now we're gonna make it translucent. At the stage of translucent, the, all the sugars are there, it's quite sweet actually. It becomes much sweeter than when it is, and all the, the, the heat of the onion, the what makes you cry, goes away, evaporates. And then it turns into light golden, then dark golden. So the, it's used for every different purpose. And if you take the, you cook it a little bit more than what is required, it'll make a difference in the taste of the dish. It won't be the same, right? Really, and then if you, someone, some people told me that, some of my chefs tell me, hey, you're browning the onion, why don't we just deep fry it and put, put the brown onion inside? I, absolutely, you can do it. But what happens there? You've lost all the essence of the onion in the oil which you deep fried it in. Right? Because there's no coating like fish and chips to, to, to seal the flavor inside. It's gone in the oil. It's like lobster. When we cook lobster, blanch lobster in my restaurant, right? We blanch it and then they, in a salted water, they put it in regular water, cold water. Lobster lives in the ocean. What's, what's the salinity of the ocean? It differs from ocean to ocean. It lives in salt water, right? When you take it out, so it's got natural sodium inside its body. If you put your hand in salt water for 10 days or two hours, lick your finger after that, it's salty. Same thing lobster is, right? When you take it out, you're blanching it in, in salted water, then you're putting it in ice with no salt. What, does, what, does, what, what happens there? What happens there? The salt comes out of the water. Salt, water is the enemy of salt, right? It takes away the it takes away the salt from it because there's not enough sodium in there, right? So, so what we do is we keep the salt level as the ocean, the blanching, and the, and the thing are the same. You know, it just changes the whole science. You, you gotta try and see it yourself. So if, 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 the, if the sodium level on the ocean, where it comes from is 6%, 8%, we normally know, we do the same thing in blanching water and the same thing in chilling water. You get it? So it doesn't leave the body. The flavors don't leave the body. You know, it's in books you learn a little differently a lot of the time. But what I'm trying to say out here is you learn it as you cook, you understand it. It's a science, right? And always have to question yourself why? Why? Right? Why can't I do it this way? Why can't I be this? Why can't, why, why, why can't we drive cars on batteries nowadays and before we had to do it on gasoline or diesel? Why are we going into nitrogen? Someone thought about it. They came up with it, right? So these are the things which you have to start thinking as chefs, as, as, as how can we, then that's where the passion comes in. That's where your creativity comes in. And if you want to just be, learn the recipe, and cook, yeah, there's nothing wrong in it. But like the, like Chef Don mentioned, the fundamentals, right? The word fundamental is the most important word in culinary, remember that. The science of the cooking does not change. Does not matter where you are, I'm repeating myself. 
What changes is the art? How you use that science to make it into an art? Whether it's a molecular gastronomy, whether it's a, it's a cuisine, or, and then <clears throat> the flavors can change, right? So that's, that's pretty much the dish. That's it. That, now this will cook, this takes about 40 minutes to cook. And we'll taste for salt and vinegar. Done. One pot meal. So, what are we, time, timeline we're doing okay? Great. Huh? Completing the samples for us. Okay. Yeah, so what is our, uh, what's the timeline now? What? We have about 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. So, I made some rice in the same dish. Now the color of the dish is a little bit dull right now. The reason for that is to dull is because that, that, that has been made two days ago. This will taste good in two days tomorrow, much better, because it's a pickling, right? The certain dish which will taste good that same day, fresh and certain takes time. So it's what, what you want, okay? Okay. As they're plating the dish, do you have any questions for me? Uh, most neutral oil and healthy. Oh, we are, I mean, as, uh, so the fat, again, uh, that's a different topic you can go into. Uh, I, I like natural fat when I cook with, either I cook with ghee, butter, tiallo, uh, lard, uh, um, grapeseed oil, or, or uh, avocado oil. Let me repeat the question. Sorry, let me just repeat the question. Sorry. Yeah. All right, so question was, uh, why are we using grapeseed oil? Yeah, it's, it's the health purpose, Jimmy. You know, I'll, that, that, makes, that brings a very interesting question. Does anybody know what's the definition of food? Does anybody have a definition of food? If you go, don't Google on your phone now, okay? <laughs> I know. Yeah, I can answer. I'm the smarter one. So what's the definition of food? You all want to cook. What, what does food mean? Definition of food. There's a one definition. If you go to a dictionary, and if you go onto your phone and you say definition of food, there's only one answer. See, I mean, this is the beauty of us, right? Human being. We want to do something, but we do not know the definition of what we are cooking. It goes back to fundamental. It's not your fault. I can, I can, I promise you 37 years out of which 20, 25 years I've been talking or having classes or having fun demonstration and all. I asked this question and today, I don't know, I forgot about it and I'm glad you brought it up. And I've never got a right answer for it. If you go, go Google on your phone definition of food or pick up a dictionary and look into it, you'll get an answer. Did anybody Google yet? <laughs> what is it? Can you read it out? Can you come and say it here loudly? Come on. Uh, any new... Any nutritious substance that people or animals eat or drink or that plant absorbs in order to maintain life and growth. So, it's to nourish yourself. For, for, the reason we eat food is for nourishment, for growth, right? That's a fundamental of food. That's why we cook. So, I say, I always compare with a doctor. When you go to a doctor, you're not feeling well, right? You say, hey, I got a headache, I got this. He gives you a tablet or a pill or whatever, you eat it, 
you don't you don't even question because it makes you feel good, right? You trust him so much. You're putting something inside your body, and you trust the doctor that he's going to make you. He's studied. He's done all of this in his life. He's going to cure you. When someone comes to your restaurant, what are you doing? You're giving them food which they're putting inside the body, trusting that you have done it. It's nourishing. It's hygienic. Right? And it's, right? So what is the very first fundamental? That's why we have, I mean, you all have a class of hygiene, food hygiene, food safety. Why do we do that? So we don't survive And we eat to survive. It's a basic necessity of human being or homo sapien. Anything with living needs food. Okay, number one fundamental of food has to be safe and nourishing before going to fashion. Right? And then comes everything else. That's the definition of food, basically. Any other questions? What is your favorite dish to eat and why? Our question was, what is your favorite dish and What why? is my favorite dish to make? Right now, it's pork vindaloo. <laughs> because I'm making it now. I'm enjoying the smell of it. Right? It changes. I will be very honest. I think for me, food is company, place, right? Place, people, what is nature giving me, right? And, and what, what the weather is. You come out of a hot weather, you go out in the afternoon, hot, it's coming back. You want something light, refreshing, salad, fresh. So it's, it's a very subjective thing. But if you ask me that, oh, if you have to have one dish, it changes. I will say it's evolved over years. One of my favorite dish to eat was my mom's lentils and rice. Okay? I have never even replicated that ever in my life. I will be very honest. I'm a chef, 37 years, you know? But I cannot replicate the way she made it. I have the exact recipe, the exact ingredients, everything, but there was something about it. I enjoyed. That's my favorite thing to eat. If you ask me from that perspective, what's my favorite thing I look forward to eat every year? I look forward to eat white truffles when it comes in season. Right? Every year. I'll tell you why. Not because I can afford to eat that. It's very expensive, I know. I'm not bougie, but, but it is a gift which comes only a certain time of the year and it's not been able to replicate anywhere else in the world. It comes from only one region in the world, one area, one specific area, and it has got a very small life. It does not have a taste, it's got a scent. Truffles do not have a taste. Right? So, everybody talks about it. I've done this experiment. I put a clip on your nose and feed you white truffle. You don't know, you're eating cardboard, guaranteed. You'll say I'm eating cardboard. Right? Your nose, then how do you taste, right? That's another thing. People taste, they say we taste with their tongues, right? You normally, your nose and your back nose. There's something called back nose. You know what a back nose is? You know when you, when you get cold, you snort and something comes in your mouth? Right? You know what is that? <laughs> Why does it come from here in your mouth? Right? It's, it's, it's a canal, it's a, it's a passage, right? That's why the doctor, you go to doctor, it's one doctor for E and T. Here, yeah. Because they're all connected. Inside there's a highway for them. They all meet somewhere, right? And that's what is used in, in when you do tasting of wines, food, you say, hey, how can Chef Don can taste this and I cannot taste it, right? Because he's, he's trained his palate, he's trained himself over a period of time to taste it. And it's not only just the nose and the tongue, it's the back nose. So the way it comes in this way, it goes back that way, not the fluid, fluid can also, is the scent, right? So all this sensory tasting happens the other way around, actually. That's why you get the nuances. That's why when you, if I give you a blend of the spice right now to taste, Oh, it tastes chili, I can, because you've seen it, garlic, vinegar. 
but the black peppercorn, the, the, the cinnamon, the clove, which we put in there, all the good stuff, you, you taste from the backside, the back nose. The, 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 the path which takes in here, it brings back the scent to your up here there, and that's where you taste it, and sends a signal to your brain, ah, that's clove. Um, there's enough lard in the pork which has come out. It has natural lard. So the, I use grapeseed oil because I needed something to do to uh, render the, the saute the onions with. Um, normally, if, if, if this is the classic way, if I make it at home, I just put the onions and everything inside one time. I don't even saute it with, with any fat. So that when the fat comes out, it gets cooked with the fat. Yeah. The flavor is a little bit different, but that's how I cook it personally. But if you, if I could teach you that way, but if you really look at 90% on 100% of the cookbooks, they'll say sauté the onions first. Yeah. How come you didn't blend it with your marination stuff? Um, the flavor changes. Yeah. So when you, it's basically you're doing, you're extracting the water of the onion out. And that water of the onion has a very different flavor than, than sauteed onions. In this, you're keeping all the onions in this. It's basically what, what, what the moment you blend it, it's like the osmosis, it brings everything out of the, it brings all the juices out. So the whole flavor profile will be different. And the caramelization will not be the same. Uh, you mentioned earlier, when you first started, cooking is all about passion. What gives you your passion about cooking? Oh, I just enjoy it because I like science and art. <laughs> I'm serious. I get, I get to be creative every day. I don't have to sit on a desk and do the same work. And um, I enjoy eating personally. I mean, it's like my passion to eat. And um, to me, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's joy. To me, when I get angry, I cook. You know, it, it's a therapy for me. And, I, and also, f first of all, I love to eat. Let me put it this way. Second of all, I like people who enjoy food, right? I didn't, I, my actually big thing was aeronautical engineer. Sorry, you know, that's what my, I went to school, I got admission into a very, 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 actually with Boeing to be aeronautical engineer for Boeing to, to build planes. That was my starting of my career. And just for the fun of it, I applied for the culinary school or the hotel school. I didn't go to culinary school first. And I got into it, I did not go to the, aeronautical college, I went to the, to the hotel school because I thought it's going to be fun, right? And there I realized that I can, I think I have a little bit of a talent to cook and a passion to cook. I didn't know I was going to be a chef, I'll be very honest. Passion to cook. And then I said, okay, let me, it took me everywhere around the globe. Um, I could eat what I want, taste all the different food, meet people, enjoy life and also make money. And there's a lot of money being a chef. Don't, let me tell you that. It's up to you, it's in your hands, where you want to be. Okay, if, if someone is telling me this profession doesn't pay, it's what you put in what comes out. You know, it's, it's your own effort, it's your own, own passion, own talent. You know, what do you want to do out of it? And if, if anybody in this world says, oh, chefs, you can't make money, I, I disagree with that. That's not true. Oh yeah. I'm sorry, you have to repeat that. Question was, is this something that so, you make for your family? Monday, Tuesday evenings, I'm not at the restaurant because we're closed for dinner. Those two evenings, I cook at home. No, and it truly depends on what mood we all are in, right? Last night, I had to do something for well, the last minute. I said to my wife and my, my daughter, let's go out to eat. They said, no, we want to eat at home. I said, okay, what do you want to eat? There was some roast chicken which, which we had left over, right? I took the roast chicken, I cooked some koshikari rice. I sauteed it quickly with black pepper sauce, which we make 
our own black pepper sauce in my restaurant with some bell peppers and had it. So it's very simple. It's like when I eat at home, it depends. There are days I eat Indian, the days we eat, uh, you know, pork vindaloo. So it is, it's never the same. I would be very honest with you. It's never the same in my house. Yes. question is who inspired you to be a chef who inspired me to become a chef I think the food yeah and then um, when I started cooking I started enjoying it so much which I didn't realize sometimes you say no you you you, you don't know what you want and then you figure out and you start enjoying it so I'll give you an example during COVID or uh, once I left Halikulani and the restaurant was done I was doing I had a big company where we were buying hotels and doing hotels. So I was so detached from cooking for about two years. I had a restaurant, but I was not spending enough time in cooking or creating stuff. I think I was the most miserable two years I had. And I made way more money than I made as a chef, right? But it was the two most miserable years I had. And I said, okay, you know what? I just want to go back to it. It's just a love for food. It's, um, it's, and who inspired me once I started cooking? A couple of inspirations I have. I had quite a few good mentors when I, when I went to school. Uh, some of the chefs you would not know, they're not world known. Uh, actually, two of them were my professors in the college who taught me. And <clears throat> after that, does I was given in, in 1990, I did a competition for the, this company I was working for. And I got gifted a book called White Heat, right? If you've heard of it, his name of the chef is Marco Pierre White. He's from London. The book is called White Heat. This was written in 70s, right? Late 70s, early 80s, the book was written. You know Gordon Ramsay, who's Gordon Ramsay? So Gordon Ramsay's mentor is Marco Pierre White. <coughs> Let me put it this way. So Gordon Ramsay learned cooking from Marco Pierre White, or he worked under Marco Pierre White. So he's still relevant, he's still there. He's, he's, he's on the same league as Paul Bocuse and that, that, that era chef, what he call it. He was one of the biggest inspiration I had. And I always tell people that if you buy the White Heat book or look up the White Heat book, he talks so much about cooking philosophy and life as a chef and everything in there. And he hardly talks about recipes in there. He's got some dishes. Of course, you got to write a book to sell marketing, the money, you know. We don't live on love and fresh air, you got to make money. So it's a very inspirational book. So it's like on food and cooking, Marco Pierre White. So there are a few cookbooks out there which you, which you, or books out there which you read, which inspires you. And either it's in you or it's not in you. Let me put it this way. I've seen enough people over the years in different countries and continents it got to be inside you if you want to be a chef. The recipes don't make you a chef. It's a drive, it's the passion. You know, I'm pretty much, I've lived three-fourths of my life, you know. Um, most of my life, I mean, if you look at it, more than 60%, uh, 65% of my life I've been cooking. And someone asked me, will you give it up? I, I, I don't think so. I tried. It doesn't work. <laughs> Chef, we've got time for one more question. Yes. What is the best advice you've ever given? Best advice I have been given? Uh, never. Actually. I will take it off the cooking, and I was golfing with the golf pro, okay? And there's a little bit of a language in there, but I'll cut it out, <laughs> right? So, so we have these tournaments where you can have a golf pro to golf with you. I was golfing with him, and my drive was going right, right? I kept asking him, he kept telling me. After he kept telling me it's a loft. Have you heard loft in I mean golf? They say it's a loft. Loft means ball goes somewhere else. And um, 
So in the end, I was on the 17th hole. I said, okay, I heard this loft almost 15 times in this course. I said, what does this loft mean? You know? He said, you've not practiced enough. I said, you're absolutely right. So I said, what is loft? He said, lack of effing talent. <laughs> Right? You got it? Remember that game, right? Right? He said, lack of effing talent. What does that mean? That was the best advice I will tell you. I mean, this was only about eight years ago. I mean, I, it, he's the pro. I mean, we, we have paid so much of money for him to golf with him, so he'll give me lessons. He's, he's guiding me, but and keep telling me it's a loft, it's a loft. Uh, what the heck is the loft, right? That's, and, and that, that thing stuck in my head. <laughs> Next day onwards, I went to, I would say, at least every time I got an hour that I can spare, I'll go to some place to hit the balls and try to get that loft right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. I think the time is up. Sorry, thank you so much.